Turn, turn me down, son. I'm, I'm echoing everywhere up in here. Sound like I'm in a hall somewhere. Adjust this thing. Hallelujah. Isn't it wonderful to be in church this morning? Amen. Amen. You could be a lot of different places, but you're in church, and that's Amen. the grace of Almighty God. Amen. Without the grace of God, you'd never be here. There's going to come a time and your place. You're going to have to humble yourself to Almighty God and say, God, I need you. God, I want you. Lord, hold my hand. Now, in the masculinity world, very few of us left on the planet, but there are some men with masculinity. And with all that being said, there ain't nothing feminine about a man crying out to Almighty God saying, hold my hand, Lord. That's right. In fact, the Bible says, unless you humble yourself as a little child, come to him as a little child, you'll never see the kingdom of heaven. Amen? So you can be masculine and be a man of God. That's right. A lot of people don't think you can. You can be masculine and be a man of God. And in fact, to be a man of God, you're going to have to be masculine. Hallelujah, man. Sing it again, Brother Jesus. Hold my hand. When I wander through the valley. church this rainy Sunday morning.
Is there something in your heart between you and the Lord? Are you drifting apart, not as close anymore? There's nothing you can do that he will not forgive. Bring it to the cross, let it die so you can. to the cross. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, I was lost, 
but you knew just where to find me. I was hungry, you were brave for my soul. I was thirsty, and you gave me living water. You were my shelter when I had no place to go.
God bless your heart. Now listen to me for a minute. In, in every human being, every man, God created all things. God took clay. Come on, play with me, baby. God took clay, molded it in the likeness of his image. And then he breathed it and went, whoo, and he become a living soul. Now he put it in that first man to worship him. You hear me? And even though Adam fell, every man, every son of Adam born on this planet has had the same opportunity to come to God and walk with God as Adam has. Amen. God's not a respecter of person. Every man's got the same opportunity. Now, if you take advantage of it or not, that's between you and God. And sadly, most people don't. You see, if, if pe people say, all, I've heard it many times spoken, even to me, said, well, if there's a God, Brother Nisha, Pastor Nisha, if there's a God, then, then why does he let all this ugly go on? The reason why the ugly is going on is because people won't serve God. If people will serve God, you don't have to lock your door. There'll be nobody making methamphetamine. There'll be nobody selling it. There won't be no bootlegging going on. There won't have, you wouldn't need no police. You wouldn't even leave, you wouldn't need a military. You hear me? The reason why you have to have police and military and laws and you have to lock your doors. You can't leave your purse in your front seat and window down at the grocery store. And the reason why is because people won't serve God. So don't blame God for what man refuses to do. You hear me? Ain't God's fault this world is ugly. It's man's fault this world is ugly. God has stepped into the darkness of man's world and offered Christ as Savior so that even though a man is in the ugly world, he can be in fellowship with God because of his faith in Christ and him crucified. Because that blood of Jesus that was shed for all men, every man's sin has been paid for. Every man, every woman, every man, every woman, child, everybody's sin has been paid for. Because Jesus didn't, didn't pay for just some people's sin, he paid for everybody's sin. But because man loves the pleasure of sin and himself more than God, he won't repent. He won't cry out to God and have that sin debt paid for. Amen? He won't come into relationship with him. And the Bible's very clearly is why men won't come to the light, which Jesus is the light, because men love darkness. Why? Because their deeds are evil. So it is in you, and all you watching by internet, it's in us to worship something. You're either going to worship God with your whole heart. There ain't no, after, there ain't no in between now. There ain't no lukewarm that's going to be accepted by God. There's no straddling the fence. You're either all in or all out. Amen. I've had people tell me before, so I'm going to go to hell anyway. I might as well have a party. Hell ain't going to be no party, people. You hear me? Hell ain't no party. You think everybody's got a, people got a fictitious understanding of what heaven is, and people got a, fic, mis, a fictitious understanding of what hell is. You need to get in the Bible and find out what both of them are. Amen? But inside of you is a desire to worship God. You're either going to worship God or worship man. One or the other. You're going to do one or the other. Amen? You're going to praise. And that God that, that you're going to serve outside of God, and the people say, well, uh, you serve either God or Satan. God and Satan are not equal. God is creator. God's God. Satan is a created fallen being. It's a pawn. He's allowed, he allowed certain uh, opportunities. He's allowed certain authority because Adam gave it to him. God allows him to do certain things, but he's going to answer before God as well. Amen. He's going to the lake of fire as well, too. Amen. He's going there. He knows he is, and third of the angels fell with him. So really, you're not worshiping Satan. You're either worshiping God or you're worshiping yourself. You hear me? Number one enemy is that person looking in the mirror at you every morning. You're either going to submit to God or you're not. You're either going to worship God or you're going to worship yourself. You're going to lift yourself up in authority over God or you're going to lift God in authority over you. Amen. You're going to have to decide this morning. Am I going to follow the Lord Jesus Christ or I'm going to follow myself? Amen. This is the very last church. This could be the very last church service that you ever sit in. Amen. So as Brother Zach sings this song again, if you can stand and worship God, stand if you can. Those watching my internet, you can stand at home. Lift your hands unto the Lord and praise Him now. I was lost, but you knew where to find me. I
You may be seated. God bless you. I appreciate you coming to worship and God with me this morning. Those watching by internet, those that will be watching later on, thank you for tuning in, being with us on this rainy, cold, chilly Sunday morning. And I appreciate those that drove long distances, taking the time to drive in, those local came in. And appreciate all the ladies and people that brought in food for next door and those that stayed up last night uh, cooking uh, pork and, and uh, for you. And, and uh, we have a wonderful Christmas dinner together as a family after church service this morning. If you follow along with me in your bulletin, don't forget every Sunday morning is prayer meeting at 9 a.m. Sunday school, 9.45. Tomorrow night at 10, uh, tomorrow night at, at uh, 7 o'clock we have a prayer meeting. We encourage you to take the time to come out and be with us in prayer meeting. If you cannot attend, you can isolate yourself, get with your family in your living room, however you so desire to do it. And remember on 7 o'clock on Monday night, we're praying for this church's congregation in our community and as well as our country and our state, and we ask you to do the same. Wednesday night Bible study is at 6 o'clock, so we encourage you to participate and be with us. Children's ministries as well at 6. All right, uh, funeral services. Brother Harvey Banks passed on to glory uh, this earlier this week, gone home to be with Jesus. Sister Banks is with us this morning. God bless you, darling. We love you. We're going to be with you. We're praying you're going to be all right. You're going to go through this, and God's going to won't forsake you. He's going to hold your hand. And, but you're invited to participate with us this coming Tuesday at 2 o'clock. Brother Harvey's funeral service will be Tuesday at 2 o'clock at Chapelwood in Nash, Texas. Is that correct? Chapelwood, Nash, Texas at 2 o'clock. And uh, Brother Harvey and, and uh, Sister Irene have been members of our church for about nine years. I believe it's been nine years. And, and uh, Brother Harvey's always sitting in the back and always standing back there shaking everybody's hand and and uh, greeting everybody, and, and if he can lock you off to the side, he'll talk to you about 45 minutes on Sunday morning, and he had a lot to say, amen, and uh, rather you be that way than the other way, look at me and don't say a word, but anyway, Brother Harvey would truly be missed in this church, he was faithful, he loved the Lord, he faithfully supported this church, faithful in attendance and in time, and uh, we're going to miss him, but we'll see him soon enough, amen, and uh, so, uh, uh, if you can be with us, uh, visitation is tomorrow uh, at the funeral home from, I think, 8 o'clock in the morning to 7 o'clock at night. And uh, so you can go anytime, pay your respects, and sign the uh, uh, register. And, uh, but if you can be with us Tuesday, morning, Tuesday afternoon at 2 o'clock, we appreciate your attendance. Tomorrow, uh, next Sunday will be our communion service. It will be our Christmas celebration service, actually com uh, Christmas service. We had our children's ministry last week. We have our fellowship meal this week. And then next Sunday, I'll, Lord willing, I'll preach a Christmas message to us. And we'll have communion together as a body of believers. And water baptism service January the 3rd. If you have not been baptized in water and you so desire to, as the Word of God instructs you to do so, it makes no sense to cry out to the Lord and then not follow what the Lord says do. It's kind of silly. So the first act of obedience as a child of God is to be baptized publicly before men confessing Christ. Here, uh, we're celebrated. Overseas, you can be killed for it, lose job, family, position, and everything else. So it's more costly overseas. But if the Lord tarries and lingers long enough, and you're going to see it over here too. Amen. There's going to come a separation in America. And I need to make this point. Quit, quit, everybody needs to quit putting the timeline of God's return to this church based on the church in America. That's really arrogant. Okay, we all, people keep saying we're in the Laodicean era. Well, there's no Laodicean church sitting over in Africa, and very few if there is, South America or anywhere. Listen, the church in America is not the cornerstone of God's movement timeline. It's Israel. You want to watch something, you watch Israel, not the condition of the church in the United States. I'm sorry to hurt everybody's feelings, but God's not sitting around falling to pieces because the church in America as a whole has rejected, or America as a whole has rejected the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? It didn't surprise him one bit. Sad to him, breaks his heart. But, but, but let's not get wrapped around the axle. If the people serving God can be persecuted in Pakistan, Iran, and Iraq, and China, around the rest of the world, they, God's true people can be persecuted here in the United States. Amen? And it's coming just as sure as Jesus is coming. If he tarries, it's coming. And uh, uh, people in America want, want a, a, a pedophile, ungodly, God, ungodly individual in the White House. You're going to get what you sowed. You're going to get it, and it's coming back. Amen. Church of America needs to rise up, pray, seek the Lord, and determine in the heart they're going to serve Almighty God. Amen. Amen. Keep a Bible in hand and a loaded pistol at all times. Amen. Hallelujah. 
What do you mean, Brother Matt? Exactly what I said. Keep your Bible read, keep it close, and keep your pistol with you at all times. Nothing wrong with that. You don't like it, I don't care. Moving on. All right. Water baptism January the 3rd, and then Lauren Larson be with us on March the 12th. Go ahead and mark your calendars, 13th and 14th. Mark your calendars down. For the ushers to come at this time to wait upon you for your Sunday morning tithing offering. We appreciate your faithfulness and getting unto the Lord a tithe and a free will offering led by the Holy Spirit, directed by the Word of God. We appreciate your giving a wonderful offering to uh, Sister BJ last week, but today is our Mission Sunday uh, of the month. Please put your missions offering in this offering as well. We have obligation to meet our missionary needs every month. Doesn't matter if it's Christmas or not. So we appreciate you giving towards missions. So go ahead and do that now. We won't take a, a specific offering up that. If we don't get enough in, I'll do it sometime in the month of December. But but remember your mission obligation. You can't outgive the Lord. You can't buy God either. He's not for sale. Amen. Amen. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this offering about to receive. In Jesus' sweet and holy name, and everybody said, Amen. Joy to the world. Children's Bibles, those of you that order children's Bibles, they should be in this week. So uh, make sure you're here Wednesday night and uh, make sure if you order them Wednesday night and of course Sunday because they're supposed to be in this week and uh, y'all can go. And uh, we'll get the, the ones of y'all that ordered, we'll get them to you uh, uh, so you can get them wrapped in, in, uh, under uh, the tree. I, I, I saw something, though. I listened to a message the other day about the history of the Christmas tree. There's a lot of a lot of people try to bring controversy up with a Christmas tree and and uh, uh, that you shouldn't have a Christmas tree. The Bible speaks against decorating a tree. Well, a proper exegete or next proper study is that is a pagan worship of the tree and a god. And you decorate the tree as in reverence. And if you put in presents underneath the tree to worship the tree. Let me tell you. Does everybody understand that? Now, let me tell you what the actual history of the Christmas tree. Martin Luther was out having a, have a, have a prayer meeting, a prayer time with the Lord. It was Germany, and I forgot what trees it was, spruce or something. I don't remember what it was, some kind of, some kind of tree. And uh, uh, it was late at night. It was a frigid night, and there were stars all out, and he was spending time with the Lord worshiping God, and he, he saw the stars between the trees, and it was very majestic to him. So he wanted to copy it, so he, got a, he cut a tree and took it into his home and put candles on it and tried to recreate for his family what he experienced looking God's nature and the tree and the, the trees and the stars in the background, and it become a tradition. The Lutheran Church and it spread and it's gone all, all the way out. It's, really, it's, got, it's, it's all about the tradition. You understand, Christmas is all about Christianity, and people that are not Christians celebrate it. Kind of makes no sense. 
because it's got nothing to do with people not serving Christ. It's all about Christ. Christmas is about Jesus. Come on, I'm going to preach all that next week. I'm not going to preach it today. Prayer minute, don't forget on, on your prayer request, they continue to pray for our persecuted brothers. Uh, pray for, for them. Those who are in underground church in China, those that are in uh, uh, Pakistan, those that are in. I went to purchase a knife the other day. And I was on, actually last night I was online, I was looking at the person and it said cowboy knives. It's pretty cool stuff. Some of them for castration, some of them for poking. And pretty cool knives. And, and it was, do you know what the suckers were listed as? I stand. Now, you know I didn't do it. But that's sad when you go buy American cowboy knives and it's made in Pakistan. you got to send your money to Pakistan to get it. That's just plum silly. So some of y'all want to go to knife school and get real good at it and start selling so we can buy knives made in America, sold in America. Apparently over there it's supposed to be real good at it. And I'm not saying it's not good quality. I'm just not sending money to Pakistan because all it's going to do is go on a terrorist organization, turn around and fight against our own country and, and the promoting of Islam over Christianity. And I'm not going to do it. So, But anyway, uh, pray for our underground church that is in Pakistan and our, our Christians there. Those that are in Libya, those that are in Tunisia, those that are in the Middle East, around the world, those that are in Africa, the Christian churches in Sudan, uh, even churches in America, it's, we're going to have that on the list soon enough. And uh, uh, so praying for our brothers and sisters, pray for our church ministry, outreach ministry, Christian school, missionaries, preaching the word of God, praying for our country, praying for our president, our Congress, our judicial system, also the state of Texas, and praying for our governor and the, uh, the, uh, the Republican leadership that is in Texas. Also, our military and all our law enforcement, praying for all my sons and my daughter. Uh, praying for Jerusalem, the peace of Israel. I'm praying for Sister Mary McDonald this morning. Brother and Sister Alford, also praying for Virgil Gibson. Got to touch his body. Sister Banks, with a touch the Lord, touch her body and comfort her during this difficult time uh, with Brother Harvey's homecoming. Also, Sister Cadenhead, good to see her family with us today. Gloria John, their entire family. Sister Sandy, Ben Garrison's family, the Winston and Amy. Brother James Tankersley, healing in his body and strength in his body and comfort to Sister Tankersley. We'll be going over there this evening praying with them, spend time with them. Kayla McGee with her pregnancy. Keith Braun with the recovery of his surgery and his leg. Also, Algerine Newman uh, Hospice is called in with uh, that sister, and we ask the Lord to comfort the family and comfort her. Uh, the Nunn family, ask the Lord to continue to touch their body. Alan Edwards has been diagnosed with uh, cancer, and we, need, uh, we ask the Lord to touch him. In, uh, both in his heart and his body, and then uh, a lot of we have some folk that are sick this morning. Had a family leave this, had to leave church because a child got sick this morning. Also, email and messages all those that message us and call us and request prayer request. Uh, Dwayne Hastings, uh, the Lord to touch his body as well, and others that call us and request prayer. Unspoken request by the raise of hands, lost loved ones. Let's all pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for every person that's gathered together in church this morning. We ask your Lord to minister to them as only you can minister. We ask you to touch them and guide them and help them, Lord. God, we ask you, God, that every hand lifted was a situation very dearly to their heart, and I know you're already intervening and touching them. We ask you, God, to touch Sister Banks this morning. We ask you to comfort her. Give her joy unspeakable and full of glory. The Holy Ghost, which is the true comforter, can comfort and touch her today. Entire family as well as they go through this process, visitation and funeral. God, we ask you to touch our congregation as a whole, those working next door, those in children's ministries. We ask you to strengthen them. We ask you to help our outreach ministries, our Christian school, our persecuted brothers and sisters, every person on our prayer list. God, we ask those that are sick, those that are coming from surgery, those that have diseases. Lord, we ask you to minister to them. In Jesus' sweet and holy name, and everybody said amen. And it's wonderful to be in church this morning. Oh, I think you need to understand the times that we're coming into. It's a privilege and a blessing man's taking it for granted to be able to come to church and worship God freely without being persecuted if the Lord does tarry which I pray he does not tarry but if the Lord does tarry it will be unless the people rise up in America and either revolt or cause a, a new have election down the road and change things it's going to come you're going to have a church in America just like you do in China but it's going to be a government church it's going to be a representative either through visual through the internet being watched or to be a person in every church and uh, hate speech will be outlawed and hate speech will be classified speaking against anything of a human race in any form or fashion. So in other words, it, it's just a law they created. You saw it years ago coming. Uh, if you speak against someone else's sin or lifestyle, it's considered hate speech. So it's coming. It just is, if the Lord tarries, it's coming unless we have a great revival and a change in government. 
or a revolution. It's a good revolution is good every once in a while and uh, change things. Amen. And uh, so uh, it's coming. But I, I can tell you right now, I'm not going to change nothing. Amen. You might as well just get to come visit me at Buy State, put money on my books. I got to have to get me a haircut every week. Got to pay for that. I like coffee. Now, they got coffee there, but you get snacks and stuff like that. And the more money on your books, the more things you get to purchase. How you know that, Brother Nice? I just do. <laughs> Tan coffee cup, orange shoes, and a blue boo county. <laughs> Moving on. Anyway, it's coming. You just mark, well, I don't believe that. Peace, 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 peace. Well, saints of God, people around the world live like this all the time, difficulties. And our country is electing all that stuff, and that's what they want. That's what they're going to get, and, and uh, it's just the way it's going to be. Amen. But I pray the Lord calls the church to the, pray. I pray for my grandchildren. I live 52 years on this earth. The Lord take me home any time. The only reason why I want to stay is because of my family. Where's his grandmother at? <laughs> Anybody seen White's grandmother? <laughs> uh, come get your grandson. <laughs> well, I don't no, we're not doing children's church. Well, he can't have me. I'm finna preach. Take him with you. You want to stay with Papa? We'll go over and sit down while I preach then. And sit up all the way, big and tall. I'll make you this. No, I ain't going to do that. But anyway. You ready? All right, I'm going to preach now. You amen me. Where was I at? You need to hurry up and get next door. These people want to eat. Just turn your Bibles to Philippians chapter 4, verse 1 through 19. I, the Lord wants to take us home, fine, we'll go. But I got grandchildren. I want, to, I want my grandchildren to be able to live free. I want my children to live free. I want my great-grandchildren to live free. I want to serve God, have the same opportunities that I did. It's not precious to people no more. That's why they're letting people take it away. I'm going to get off my soapbox. I'll, I'll preach on that some other day. But uh, Philippians chapter 4 is what the Lord put on my heart all week long for you. Subject title this morning, I have learned, therefore I know. I have learned, therefore I know. A lot of people say they know this and know that, but they never learned it. And they know, or they're always learning and never knowing. You're always learning something. You always want to go to this and always want to go to that, that revival and this mess, this over here, and you want to go over here, but you never learn, never apply it to your life. You, you only, uh, that which is applied to your life is what you know. Amen? Amen. I, I can say I know how to fix a car, but if I don't know how to fix a car, I really don't know. I just think I, you know, you can deceive yourself in thinking you know something you actually don't. But the Lord is an instructor, and he is going to teach his church, his body, to learn, and then and therefore you're going to know him. The only way you're going to know the Lord is to be born again, first and foremost. You've got to have a transformation from a son of Adam to a son of God, and that new transformation in spirit, and in God, through the grace of Christ, and who Christ is, what he's done for him, and imputed righteousness, the spirit of God flows then the individual and teaches him all things. Do you realize I cannot comfort you in your heartache? I can try, but I can't truly do it because the Holy Ghost is the only one that can. Why? Because the Bible says the Holy Spirit is the comforter. So you need to seek the Lord's comfort, not man's comfort. Amen? No husband will ever do it for you. No wife will ever do it. No job, no matter of anything, will ever do it for you. God's the only one that can do it for you. He's the only one that can put that in your heart. He's the only one that can teach you and show you. You can have all kind of degrees and all kind of understanding of theology, but yet never know him. God is going to make sure that I learn from him and therefore, learning from him, applying it to him, he's going to make sure I apply it to my life. Because if I don't apply what he's teaching me to my life, I don't apply it, I'm going to stay in the schoolhouse. Yeah. You, let me say to you, I can go to school. God's going to take me to the school of the Holy Ghost. Every one of us is going to go to the school of the Holy Ghost. You can go to all kinds of Bible colleges. They ain't the school of the Holy Ghost. The school of the Holy Ghost is God teaching. You go to school of the Holy Spirit there, and you're going to sit there in class, and he's going to teach you. And as you learn, you go, he's going to grade you how you apply it to your life. Now, listen, just because you can memorize it doesn't mean you can apply it. So he's going to make sure. Before you get on to the next grade, he's going to make sure you can apply it. It's called a practical application test. He don't care if you can memorize it. He wants to see if you can do it. And if you can't do it, you're going to stay in that classroom. Sadly, there's a lot of people that are sitting in first grade with God. 
They got out of kindergarten, but they went to first grade with God, and they're still sitting. They're 60 years old, been in church 40 years of their life, and they're still sitting in first grade. Why? Because they've never learned to apply the principles of the first grade to move on to the second grade. Hallelujah. Amen. God's going to give you that practical application test. In other words, he's going to teach you something. He's going to show it to you, reveal it to you. You're going to say, oh, praise God, hallelujah. And then you're going to have to put it to work, put it in real life circumstances, and then see how you react with it and how you conduct yourself in it. And the Lord, who is the greater of the test there, he's going to look at it. And if you don't operate right in it, then he's going to make sure you go back to the classroom to learn it again. I have learned from God, therefore I apply it to my life, and therefore I know. Philippians chapter 4, verses 1 through 19, Paul right to the church in Philippi, Christian church, and the, in verses 1 through, or verse, chapter, chapter 4, verses 1 through 19, uh, all you people that like to minister, there is at least five messages in those set of scriptures. At least five messages uniquely different messages that can be taught from the pulpit, Sunday school, in a house study or a Bible study or anywhere else. Now, I'm going to go through all five of them real quick, and I'm going to bring out the one I want to preach this morning. But the only way I can bring out the one I want to preach this morning is to rock through them. Does everybody understand? Besides that, I'm waiting for Susie to come tell me your food's ready. So just, I, just bro, Matt, you show preaching long. Ain't my fault. It's them people over there. We're going to work through it. Four, chapter 4, verse 1. Therefore, we're going to talk about unity real quick. Unity. How many of y'all realize there's got to be unity in the body of believers? Amen. If there's no unity in the body of believers, somebody's not serving God. I don't care what you say. Somebody's not walking according to God's plan if there's no unity. Now, I, cannot, I can disagree with you about chicken. I can even disagree with you without, about the weather or how to raise cows and everything. That don't mean we're not in unity in Christ. Unity in Christ means you're walking in the same truth and believing the same truth. Believing the same truth and walking in the same truth. Does that make sense? Amen. That don't mean we have to agree with everything. I mean, uh, Brother Clay, he likes to play video games. Video games, I loathe video games. He likes video games. I can take him to the pasture and I can say, hey, we're going to palpate these 100 cows. He's going to look at me like, I'm not. Well, that don't mean that we're not in unity. That means we, di we, di we disagree on how we spend our time. Does that make sense? So don't think that just because you disagree with somebody, you're not in unity. Disagreement's good. Confrontation is good. I, I mean, there's nothing wrong with confrontation. It's how you conduct yourself in that confrontation. Amen? So you're gonna have, you have to understand that. So he said, first we go to unity. So he's got these two women, and he goes into verse 2. He's got two women, Udia, Udia, uh, Udia uh, Sister Cadenhead, and Sister, and Sister Caroline. Sister Caroline has is, 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 is got a problem with Sister Cadenhead in the church. Everybody see it? That's verse 2, by the way. Look at it. Two different women. Udia and Sakichi. I can't help them. They don't know how to name kids over there. So you have this, these two women in the church, and they and they and they be the same. He says that they be of the same mind in the Lord. Everybody see that? That they be of the same mind in the Lord. That means there's got some. Dis they're not walking together in the Lord. There's a there's a riff in that church in Philippi because these two women, and they both worked with him. They both spent time with Paul, and they're working in the church. But there's some disunity on them. Now, the reason why there's disunity is because one of them is not walking in the mind of the Lord. So walking in the mind of the Lord is an obedient mind. mind obedient mind to the Father, very easily to understand, and it's very easy to, to, to comprehend this truth. Very easy. Not my will, Father, but yours. Amen? Not my will, Father, but yours. So when you're dealing with people in your church, and you're dealing with people, see, if a marriage has a rift, somebody's not walking in unity with God. Somebody's not, walk, somebody's not walking in the mind of God. See, if both man and woman un, unified and they're both Christian, then that, that's my counsel. When Christians come to my office and marriage counsel, I ask them first thing out of my mouth, are you a born-again Christian? I don't care if they go to church or not. I'm going to ask them, are you born-again Christian? Yes, I am. Are you a born-again Christian? Yes, I am. I said, okay, then here's the problem. One of y'all or both y'all, somebody's not serving God because that's what the problem is. Because there's a riff in here, see? Somebody's putting themselves before God's will. Somebody's putting themselves before God. So he said, look, walk a crucified life. Extend, go, the, God, uh, Christ, did not esteem himself higher than his father, even though he's one, and he was obedient even unto death. 
So if there's disunity, somebody's not walking the way they should be walking. And then he goes on, he says, I treat thee, yoke fellow, who's talking to in verse 3, yoke fellow, he's talking to this individual who he does not name, help those women which labored with me in the gospel, these two women, uh, Sister Caroline, Sister Cadenhead, with Cle uh, Clement also, and with our fellow laborers whose names are in the book of life. I'm not saying that their name's not in the book of life, I'm saying that there's a problem going on in church. So you could, in the verse part, first part of this message, you can speak on unity and go deep into the unity. Then in verse 4, he goes on and says, Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. He says, Let your moderation be known unto men. The Lord is at hand. Very easy to understand. He's talking about holiness. Then he goes into verse 6. Listen to it. Be careful for nothing, but in everything prayer and supplication. So unity, so first five messages, unity, dealing with anxiety, how to think as a Christian, God is a teacher and giving. So we're now we're dealing with anxiety. You want to know how to deal with anxiety? You'll find it in Philippians chapter 4. He, he, hush. He goes on and says this. He says, finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true. I'm sorry. Be careful for nothing. In verse 6, be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. Be careful for nothing. You know what that means? Be anxious about nothing. Have no anxiety about anything. Amen? But if you do have anxiety, how many of y'all have anxiety? Three people. Let me ask you again. How many y'all not? How many? How many non-liars do I have in church? <laughs> how many y'all deal with anxiety? Amen. Thank you. I deal with anxiety. You want to know when I start getting uh, feeling with anxiety? Other than I got mental issues, it's okay. They pay me. But the part of me here's, here's the thing: anxiety is because you're too connected to this temporal world. Yes. Anxiety comes from worrying about something temporal. And then worry about something eternal, because if you're walking in the eternity, you're working with God, trusting in God, work, resting in God, you ain't worried about nothing. People that worry all the time don't have very, have very little faith. People that have great faith don't worry. Well, Brother Matt, what about this? Brother Matt? I understand that. But here is what you do. We all have anxiety at times. We all have worries. Some of us have a little more excessive worry. But the worry that we're talking about here is how to deal with it. Get along with God and go spend time with him and pray. Amen. Suffer persecution, trial, tribulation, hardship. James chapter 5. What do you do? You get along with God and go pray. Doesn't say call up everybody, try to get everybody to make you feel good. I can't make you feel good. Oh, I just feel so much better when I'm around Brother Matt. No, you worshiping Brother Matt and you need to quit. You hang around me long enough, I'm going to irritate you. That's just it. Just a fact of life. Those that know me close, I don't want to irritate you, but that's all right. You can get over it. But when you get, but when you have anxiety and you have difficulties, get along with God. That's what He's telling us. Get along with God and and pray and spend time with the Lord. All right. And if you do that, He says the peace of God. If see the peace of God, that's the only thing that's going to satisfy the anxiety. Messing ain't going to do that. Uh, you know, Matt, you're still anxious. You know, what messing does just makes you don't care. That's what messing does. It makes you don't care. Oh, I'll just jump off the rooftop. Ain't no big deal. You got too much in you. You need to tow it down just a little bit. You hear me? I know what this stuff does. VA tried to put me on stuff. I said, I ain't taking that stuff. Why? Because your mind says, I can jump off the roof. I'm Superman. You ain't either. You're going to hit the ground like a rock. I ain't taking that stuff. No, sir. But you see, the pills, all the pill does, you're still anxious. It just changes your thought process to where you don't care. What God does, he takes your mind out of the, the temporal and focuses it on the eternal, and he fills you with his peace because you stop thinking about this, and you start thinking about him, and you're relying on him and trusting in him, and then he gives you the peace of God that passes all understanding, and what will it do? It'll keep your heart, your inner man, and your what? Your mind. How do you do it? Through Jesus Christ. There's your source. Faith in Christ. Faith in who he is, faith in what he's done for you at the cross, going to bring peace into you in your heart. All right, message number two. Number one, unity, dealing with anxiety. Now we're moving in. Number eight. Go, no, I'm sorry, not number eight, but verse eight. And it says, how to think as a Christian. Now look at this. I've seen this taken out of content so many times. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. Everybody see that? Now, the word of faith and the positive thinkers, I just cannot stand to be around positive thinkers. 
there is some negative in the world, people. How you, how you just always know negative. No, I'm a realist. I remember walking this woman one time. She had bald tires on her car. And on the car, I said, you better get that fixed. You're going to have a flat. You got bald tires, copper showing on one of them. You're going to have, don't speak that, brother niece. I said, well, it's the truth. Don't speak it. I'm going to have a flat now. I said, honey, you ain't going to have a flat because I said that. You're going to have a flat because you stupid. Well, I didn't say stupid. But you stupid. You're going to have a flat because you, it, well, I didn't say that either. You, you're going to have a flat because you won't go change your tires. Because you're not walking in reality. You're walking in fantasy land. You're sitting there with a growth on the side of your head. I'm not sick. I'm healed in Jesus. No, you're sick. People get it all the time. I'm not sick. Yes, you are sick. You live in a decaying body. People die. It's what happens. You live in a decaying body. God will help you through it. I'm sick and I need Jesus to heal me. There's nothing wrong with that confessing. Nothing wrong with it all. Don't speak that. No, that's, number one, this, this verse, this verse right here doesn't mean any of that. What this verse means is thinking holiness. Walking in hope is how to conduct your life as a man and woman of God. How you think is how you're going to conduct. Uh, let me show you something. Brethren, what sort of things are true? You ain't sitting there entertaining things that are false. Honest. Which sort of things are just? What sort of things are pure? Who's just and pure and honest? Christ. What sort of things are lovely? What sort of things are good report? What things are virtuous? Any praise? Think on these things. Listen, you're not going to get any truth any virtue out of pornography. You're not going to get it. You're not going to get it into horror movies neither. Horror movies don't do promote demonic activity, and all it does is glorify the demonic. You're not going to find any truth in any of that. You're not going to find any truth in, in, in alcohol and debauchery and anything else. And if you're hanging around all that stuff and thinking about all that stuff, then that stuff's what's going to be coming out of you. But rather... Think on these things. Think on godly things. When an ungodly thought in your mind, say, no, I'm, I'm renewed in, the, in Jesus' name. God, renew my mind. I don't want to think like that no more. I'm, going, I'm not going to think of my wife like that. I'm not going to think of my children that way. I'm not going to think of women that way. I'm not going to think about my friends that way. How you do that? You think on what God said think on. Let the, God, let the Lord change your thinking. Hallelujah. He'll transform you. So that's message number three there. How to think as a Christian, you got to rely on Jesus Christ. Now look at verse 9. Those things that you have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do, and God of peace shall be with you. Now going into verse 10, we're going in God is my teacher. But I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at the last your care of me hath flourished again. Kind of mingles into giving a little bit, but we'll get into giving in a minute. But I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at the last your care of me has flourished again, whereof you were also careful, but you lacked opportunity. You know why we take an offering up? To give you opportunity to be blessed by God. And you'll get into that. We'll get into that more in a minute. He said in verse 11, not that I speak in respect of want. You see, if the ministry wants your money, they're going to promote that and give you a false understanding of biblical truth of sowing and reaping. And then in the return is to get your finances and put it in their pocket and tell you you're going to get rich off of giving. The Bible doesn't teach that. The Bible don't teach that. False teachers teach that to rob you blind. Amen. Yes, sir. So when we offer, when we give, a, when we give an opportunity for you give an offering, I know I'm getting to giving. I'm going to get into it better in a minute. When we give you that opportunity to do that, we're simply giving you the opportunity to be blessed by God, and we'll go into that in a little deeper. But he says, not in respect of wants, not us trying to want something from you. We're trying to give you opportunity to be blessed. He says, for I want, for I have learned. Now look, there's our subject title. I have learned. So he's been in the school of the Holy Ghost. Talking about Paul here. Paul's talking to the church in Philippi. We have, I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. Now, the word content here means satisfied, grateful, and happy. I have been taught by the Holy Spirit to whatever state I am, whatever, whatever condition of living that I'm in, I have learned to be content with it. Do you want to know people that whine and complain all the time? You don't want to know what their problem is? They're not content. 
sun's shining. It's too bright, cloudy, too dark, raining. Oh, it's too wet, no rain, too dry, too hot, too cold. Leaves everywhere. Snow's wet, hot. Yeah, always gripping. Always, I mean, you give them silver, they gripe it's not gold. You give them gold, they gripe it's not silver. You want to know why? Because they're allowing, they're, they're, the temporal world is what's trying, they're using the temporal world and this temporal state that you're in to satisfy their heart. You're never going to be content that way. The only way to learn to be content is how they allow the Holy Ghost to teach you. Amen? The Spirit of God has to be. It's not natural in a fallen state of sons of Adam, even now that we're sons and daughters of God, to be happy all the time. You ever get around people that are just happy all the time? Don't you ever be unhappy sometimes? Yes, yeah, sometimes. But it might as well be happy about it. See, people that are content, we can be unhappy but if we learn to be content, we ain't going around smiling all the time. That gets on everybody's nerves. But we're happy to be in Christ in that situation. I mean, it's sort of sitting in the hospital, and you got IVs all in you, and you got all this hanging on you, and you got all, and they come in and say, hey, brother, how you doing? Oh, I'm just happy to be here. You lying dog. You won't want to be in that first chance you could get out, you're gone. I don't want to be here, but the Lord's got me here for a reason, so he's teaching me to be content. Amen? Amen. The Holy Spirit is going to teach you to be content, and that's satisfied, grateful, and happy. How are you going to do that? We're going to get into that. Verse 12, I know, see, I learned by the Holy Ghost, and now I know both how to be abased, and I know how to abound. In other words, he knows how to have nothing, and he knows how to be content with having plenty. How many of y'all had so much plenty, you had some to spare? One person. Let me say it again. How many of y'all had so much blessing that you, lo you, you learned how to be content? Do you realize you have to learn to be blessed? You see, when I get blessed by God, and I got blessed by God this last couple week, this last two weeks, actually. You see, I got, those of you know, I got cattle. And, and I went out, and I was checking some cattle. And I wasn't expecting nothing. I had a cow off by herself. I went over, and I said, oh, Lord, something's wrong with her. And I got off there by herself, and she had a little baby heifer, a little bull calf sucking on her. Brand new. I said, wait a minute. How in the world do you do that? You just gave me a calf this year already. See, she had a calf in January. And that girl was so blessed by God, she calved back. Within a year, she bred back in 30 days, which is not normal. 60 to 90 days is a normal breed back. So I got that girl gave me two calves in one year. Gave me one in January, at the end of January, and gave me one at the end of November. Now, in the cattle business, we call that blessed. So I thanked the Lord for it, and I said, Whoo! Brother James said, Man, you're walking in favor. I said, I guess so. When I went out there the first week of December and was looking around again, and I saw Mama walking around, and I wasn't expecting her to calf till March. Guess what she had by her side? She had a little heifer calf sucking on her. I had no words to do that. Well, she gave me a calf in February 2020, and she gave me a calf in early December 2020. So that's two of them that gave me calves twice in a year. That just don't happen. Then two days ago, I was out in the pasture checking out my cows. And I seen a mama walking up with a brand new baby. I said, how in the world do you saw you do that? And I looked off to the right, and there was another baby walking up with a cow. That girl gave me a baby in February, end of February, and gave me twins in December. So that's four calves that was not expected to drop till March. And I got them at the end of November and got them in the end of December. Now, John, Brother James said, Man, Brother Matt, you're just walking in favor of God. You know, you have to learn to be blessed because you know what's in the back of my head? Uh-oh. <laughs> something bad's coming. <laughs> Why does it always got to be something bad? Why can't you be blessed? You got a heavenly father that you love. We know none of us are perfect. So you can't offer up your perfectness. Therefore, you can't offer up your unperfectness when you're blessed. 
Why are you blessing me, God? I'm a failure all the time. Why are you blessing me, God? I, I walk around with anxiety. Why are you blessing me, God? I, I think I'm the worst pastor in the whole world. Why are you blessing me for? So you got to learn to be blessed. Just like when everything's going bad, I think we're more comfortable with the abase than we are with the abound. Because when we're sitting in the abase, when we're sitting with nothing, we can sit there and cry out to God, Oh, Lord, you're teaching me to be content. Oh, Lord, you're teaching me to trust you. I thank you for this bread. But when I got ten pieces of bread sitting there, we start thinking, This is a trick, isn't it? <laughs> That's what I start thinking. This is a trick. The devil's trying to catch me in something. The devil's trying to get my mind wrapped up too much in cattle. So I'm getting up. Do y'all realize that only good things come from God? And four babies dropped off in your lap at the end of November and 1st of December. They weren't supposed to be dropped off till March. And they're healthy cows too. That's blessed. So why would the devil bless me? He's not going to. You hear me? We have to learn to be blessed. We have to learn. We have to be taught by the Holy Ghost. I'm blessing you, not because you're good. I'm blessing you because your faith is in Christ. Amen. Just like if all four of them calves died, I have to be content in the death because when my, one of my calves do die or a cow doesn't breed back, I have to say, Lord, I trust you. Lord, I lean on you. You've blessed me before. You'll bless me again. The Lord giveth. And the Lord taketh away, blessed be the name of the Lord. And I go across that pasture rejoicing. When I get extra calves and I get extra blessed in cattle business, I sit there going across the pasture going. Why are you blessing me for? Don't you want to give good gifts to your children? You have to learn to be blessed. So Paul is our example. I know both how to have nothing and I know how to abound everywhere and in all things. I am instructed both to be satisfied in full, and I am instructed to be satisfied when I'm hungry. So that totally blows out the mindset that you're never going to be hungry. That blows the mindset that you're never going to have need in serving God. See, people have created such a, a silly gospel that's not biblical that any time you do suffer, that you think God's against you. But at the same time, you swing that pendulum over to the strict line holiness people that I come out of. If you're being blessed, it's got to be the devil because God just don't bless us. So both of them are in error. The strict holiness movement that says if you're blessed, the devil's blessing you. And it's the same thing. If you're not being blessed, you're doing something wrong with God. You don't have faith. Now, I got faith, and I'm trusting the Lord. But I have to learn by the Spirit of God both to not have enough, yet trust Him, and at the same time to be blessed with my socks blown off by God to where I can praise Him and say, now what? Here's the instruction. God's for me. Who can be against me? Blessed be the name of the Lord. I didn't do that. God did. I told a man that, and he said, man, that's just good cattle work right there. That's just a good herdsman, man. You're doing right with your men. We're doing right. You're doing good. I knew, no, no, no. Don't. Get away from me. That's my father blessing me. Amen. See, so the temptation, the temptation over here when you don't have anything is, oh, God doesn't love me. That's a lie. The other temptation over here when you got it all going good, yeah, I know what I'm doing. Got it all under control. You see, both attitudes are wrong. So when you're in the school of the Holy Ghost, he teaches you to trust him in both places, and he puts it out there for now you to apply it. And when you go to apply it, if you come up with the wrong attitude, <laughs> boy, you're going back to first grade. Go back in the classroom and sit down because you said something stupid. You're still, in, I still love you in this relationship with me, but I'm going to teach you don't, don't touch my blessing and claim it to be yours. Right. In other words, don't claim the outcome or the reason you got blessed is because of you. And at the same time, when bad things happen and the devil goes, gets him, I mean, I remember when I flipped my cow truck, I mean, I was hauling cattle and on my own rig and I was driving, I was passing out, I mean, I was 
thought I was serving God. I was pastoring this church, I was raising my family, trying to give something to my oldest son, turn a business over to him so he wouldn't have to struggle like I did. And you always want better for your kids. So I was trying to build something for him. I was trying to build Susie a house. I was, I was trying to get cattle for my grandkids who weren't even here yet. And I was, I was doing all this stuff. And I was passing out Bibles to people. I was telling people about Jesus all the time. I was pastoring church, preaching a revival. Somebody booked me. And, and all of a sudden, I flip my cow truck upside down. And I walk out. Thank God I climb out. And the first thing comes out of my mouth, I look up at, to the sky. And I said, I just bought a case of Bibles. But you know what I went through my mind? Lord, why'd you let that happen? What, what am I doing wrong? What have I done wrong? Maybe I'm doing, I wasn't doing anything wrong, and Satan wanted to shift me his wheat and requested to, and said, let me touch him. He'll curse you. Job was serving God, walking with God. He lost his family, lost all his cattle, lost all his, his labor, his hands, lost his children. God let him keep his old wife and said, curse God and die. You talk like a foolish woman. But what did God do? Restored all of it. Maybe those extra calves is because I didn't curse God when I flipped my cow truck and he's giving me something better than what I could do with my own strength. Can't you be blessed? Can't you be blessed with a, a mind for business? Can't you be blessed with wisdom? You just don't let it replace God. It's very difficult for people that have nothing to fund the gospel around the world. It's very difficult if Brother Ryan is working, taking care of his family, and doing everything he can, and his washer and dryer goes out, and he doesn't have the money to fix it, and of course life doesn't go around washing dryers, wife can wash them in the sink. We just assume it's horrible. That you don't have a washer and dryer, but our grandparents lived without them forever. But let's get back to the point. If I'm not serving the Lord and I'm not prudent and I'm not wise in business and I don't know how to take care of my business to where I have finances extra and the Lord puts on my heart, He can't put on my heart, go buy Ryan a washer and dryer if I don't have the finances to do it. If we're all Dirt dog poor, we can't help each other. So God gives us minds for business. God blesses us financially. We just have to keep in proper perspective that it comes from God, and it is God's, and we give God what belongs to God and say, Lord, bless me so I can bless others. Maybe you ought to put it in your heart, bless me that I can bless others. You can't bless others if you always need to be blessed. Somewhere along the line, you got to get taken by the Holy Ghost out of the condition of needing help to help him. So there's nothing wrong with God advancing you. Somewhere along the line, you've got to come out of the help. I need help to help him. And you can't help nobody if you're always needing help. Amen? So we have to learn from the Holy Spirit to be blessed, just like we have to, and to be content with it. At the same time, be, be, learn to be content when I don't have anything. Amen. Hallelujah. And not always go around like I do when I do get blessed thinking it's a trick. I mean, why would I trick my sons? I buy my, I'd buy my sons whatever they need. Not everything they want because then they become brats. But I, I, I guarantee you my kids need clothes. I bought it. They needed this. They bought it. And I wanted to give them their wants, too. As long as they maintain the right attitude, they got it. But if they come up with a bad attitude with their want, guess what they did not get? They didn't get their want. But bless God, they got their need. Ain't that good? Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Moving right along. He goes on. He says this. He says, I'm instructed both to be hungry, to be full, and to be hungry. Both to abound and to suffer what? I asked God that I be the biggest giver in this church. I'm not. I'm not far from it, but I'm not. But I want to be. Not so I can brag to you or I can tell other people. It's so that I can be the I want to be so blessed by God that I can give to other people. Amen. He said, now look, how do you learn to be content? I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. Now people take this out of content all the time. 
I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. How many of y'all realize your strength comes from God? Now, you cannot go get on a bull and ride that bull and have on your, t have on your jacket, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That's not what he's talking about. You can't go do what you want to do and then say, God's going to give me the strength to do all things. No, I'm going to ride this Harley. No, God, and you're going to crash because you don't know how to ride a motorcycle. I can do it because God's going to give me the ability. No, that's not what he's talking about. He's going to give you the ability to be content. Amen. Quit thinking things out of context. When you have nothing, and he's going to give you the ability to be content when you have everything. Amen? How are you going to learn it? How are you going to walk in it? Of course, through the school of the Holy Ghost, but you're going to come through Christ. So when I'm sitting there saying, oh, God, help me, Christ is going to strengthen me. When I'm sitting there saying, oh, God, pray, I praise you, when I see those calves, I said, thank you, Jesus, for these blessings. He's going to strengthen me so that I don't dare take the credit. <laughs> Do you see that? He's going to strengthen my relationship because I'm putting my trust in him that I don't dare take the credit. At the same time, when I'm going through difficult times and Satan's telling me, oh, he's abandoning you, he doesn't love you, he's forsaken, you're pathetic anyway. When he throws those darts at me, when I, when I sit there and I go, but I trust the Lord Jesus Christ. God's going to strengthen me to keep my faith and proper relationship when I'm suffering and keep my faith and proper relationship when I am being blessed. Yeah. Everybody see that? Yeah. Amen. Ain't God wonderful? Now, if you'll go on and read and you keep going, you'll find out how to give. You'll find out why you're supposed to give. And I'll even show you, and then I'm going to let you go. Look at what it says. It says in verse 17, it says, Not that I desire a gift, but I desire fruit that may abound to your account. How many of y'all realize you got an account with God? Amen. And you got fruit in it. Some of y'all got empty baskets, but that's all right. God teach you. He'll teach you. But I have all. You can't buy God. He's not for sale. But I have all, and I bound, I'm full, and receive from Euphroditus the things which were sent from you. Now watch what it is. An odor of sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable, well-pleasing to God. So they're giving to this man of God, this ministry for the work of the gospel's sake. Their giving was considered a sweet smell, an odor, a sacrifice acceptable, pleasing unto God. If they gave it with the right heart and motive. Amen. 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 Your giving can also be a, stink, a stench in the nostrils of God. What do you mean, Brother Matt? I put $10,000 in the offering plate this morning. Everybody's going to slobber up and down your leg. Preacher going to fall to pieces on you. Oh, thank you so much for giving that. Oh, you're so wonderful. Oh, and Ryan put a dollar in there. Hey, Ryan. Oh. Hey, Brother Neil, I ain't got time, Ryan. Oh, you're so wonderful. You gave $10,000. But the reason why that family put $10,000 in is to buy the preacher. And, and, and when he doesn't do what they say, then he goes, he says, well, you need to know who's tithing and who don't. And then you come back and you say, well, I don't know who tithes and who don't. Maybe you ought to check. How do you know that, Brother Matt? Because that's been said to me in my office. <laughs> who y'all thought was such a wonderful person. Right. Oh, he's so wonderful. He stunk in the mouth and the nostrils of God because he would threaten me with money. Yeah. And then when the offering plate went by, he took his offering out and showed it to me, put it back in, and tapped it and said, that man don't fear God. You hear me? We have to learn to be blessed. We have to learn to give. We have to sweet Savior unto the Lord. It's a blessing unto God. But we don't give so that we can be praised. We give out of obedience. We give because God's blessed us so much. Amen. Amen. I want to be the biggest giver in this church, and I pray that God takes me to that place. Why? Because I love y'all. And if Ryan needs a, 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 a Ryan needs a, a, a washer and dryer, I want to be able to say, "Go buy your washer and dryer. I'll take care of it." Not for him to owe me something, so that I can take that burden off his back. Now, if he was lazy and wouldn't work, you ain't getting jack. Enjoy yourself the laundromat. 
Amen? So you weigh it out. Everybody understand? Philippians chapter 4, verses 1 through 19, five messages thrown at you very quickly this morning. Go back and read that chapter and read those verses and let the Lord teach you that technically it all comes back to this one point, putting your total holistic trust in Jesus Christ. Amen? Teach me, Lord. Show me, God. Help me, Lord. Have the right attitude. Help me walk in character, proper character. Teach me all things that you want me to know, Lord. And I guarantee you, he will not keep it from you. Amen? Amen. Everybody stand. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We pray. Where my piano player at? Here you go, brother. Praise the Lord. Come on, piano player. Yeah, you can stay with me. Father, we love you and we praise you and we glorify you and we magnify your name above all names. We thank you for your goodness and mercy. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this wonderful day. Even though it's rain outside, it is wonderful because we obviously need the rain. And Father, we ask you, Lord, to touch these people that's traveled that's long distance. Father, we ask you, Lord, to touch us these days we gather together. Put the word of God in our heart, Lord. Forgive us of sin. Forgive us of doubt. Forgive us of bad attitude. God, we ask you, Lord, to touch our character. Prep, prepare us for the days ahead, Lord. Prepare our hearts for the days ahead. Put the word of God in us, Lord, and protect us from all that is ungodly. Protect us from all that is wicked. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen. Ain't the Lord wonderful? Amen. Hey, man. Let's lift our hands to the Lord just for a moment and thank him for his goodness and his mercy and his love. Father, we thank you so much for saving us. And if there be not uh, be one person in here that's not born again, humble yourself this morning and say, Lord Jesus, take me. Forgive me of my sin. Take me, I'm yours. Wash me and forgive me in Jesus' name. And I promise you he'll sure do that. He'll transform me from darkness to light. From lack of understanding to understanding in the process of growing into the, the very image of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Amen. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise this morning. You may be seated. They gave me a thumbs up, so we're ready to go. Where you, where you, where you at there? Where you, Brother, Bl uh, Brother Blaine. Brother Brad, ask the blessing over the food. <laughs>